Want to patent your invention? The chance is near. You've given it heart. Now get it in gear. It's Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Well, hello, listeners. Today we've mixed the format up a bit. We have the pleasure of having a guest and an executive spotlight, along with two pitches. Our guest, Sean Kim, is a globe-hopping entrepreneur who speaks four languages and wears many hats. He also helps people find what they love, and his goal is to get everybody speaking multiple languages all over the planet. And we also have with us tonight our executive spotlight, Jeff Harmon. He's somebody that I've known for years, and we'll be discussing how to become a better leader by using your inner brilliance, and also we'll be talking about his new online coaching platform. So without further ado, Sean, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me on, guys. You were saying before the show that you had kind of an interesting and unique entrepreneurial journey. Can you share that with our listeners? Yeah, it's unique. I don't know if it's the sexiest uh, beginnings in terms of how these stories start, but I initially started entrepreneurship, just did a few small projects while I was in college. And of course, those never really work out to be a profitable ventures. But so what was, were those projects, by the way, just out of curiosity, were related to what you're doing now or? Completely unrelated. Uh, it was more of a survival thing where obviously when you're in college, you're, you're broke, so you don't really have a lot of money. <laughs> so what I would do is uh, I would hand out these local cards that I would print out and I would give these to the students in college for free. Uh, And at one point we printed out tens of thousands of cards and it was all distributed for free. So I could go back to these small businesses around the colleges and offer discounts to the students back. And I had these businesses paying me a monthly fee for exclusive advertisement and access to these students. I mean, it was a great small little business while I was in college, of course, but unfortunately, it's it's a very hard business to scale, uh, you know, since, of course, it's number one limited well, to colleges. Sort, sort of a miniature version of Groupon, right? That's exactly <laughs> it, yeah. But we all know how that turned out in the end, right? So... So after college, then what did you do? Uh, well, speaking of college, actually, uh, the, the turning point here is that I actually never finished college. Um, I went through a entrepreneurship program while I was in college. And in my last year, I decided to drop out. What did your parents think about that? Well, I've got Asian parents, so... Oh, my gosh. Uh, it's a never... Mom was was not happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think they only knew, like, three professions that existed, which is, like, doctor, lawyer, and accountant. And I was, I was, it's a completely new concept. So on top of that, I decided to drop out. I actually couldn't really tell them. I knew I already knew the reaction that I would be getting from them if I told them, and I didn't have a plan to, to do what I was going to do after. So I, like any logical person would do, I booked a one-way trip to Argentina. And <laughs> <laughs> you that's logical. They can't yell that far, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just thought that was a logical thing to do. And I thought it was going to be like a one-month trip. I had like $700 in my, in my entire bank account. I was just a student at this point. And I realized, well, number one, this is like a side caveat. I don't know how long of the tangent you're going to go on. But in Argentina, what you can do is you can take U.S. currency go to the black market and almost double your money because the currency was super unstable while I was in Argentina and still is. People view like the U.S. currency the way we view gold as like a way to hedge against the currency. So I kind of survived off that for like three months or so to the point where I started to consult for companies online. And part of how I got into the current company called Ripe, which is helping people learn a language, about nine months into uh, my trip to Argentina and living in Colombia after, I realized that I couldn't actually speak any Spanish like nine months in, which is kind of embarrassing. Like I knew the basic words and vocabulary uh, just from YouTube, Duolingo, all these apps that are free. But when it came to speaking with someone or be at a bar and trying to talk to a girl or something, I just would completely blank out and I just couldn't form sentences together. So I realized that the core problem that most people have when learning a language is speaking and communicating and having a fluid conversation with someone where most apps today are built around just using your fingers. It's kind of like playing a game. You're not actually exercising any speaking muscle. So that's really the central focus of what we do at Ripe is we're using AI and speech recognition to help you learn a language by speaking it from day one. So it's a completely different muscle that you're using. Instead of using your fingers, you're able to speak from day one at your own time, at your own convenience. 
and you're able to get that repetition in before, kind of like learning any skill, really. I have to confess, I've always been really bad at foreign languages. I almost didn't graduate from college because I got like a D minus in German. Mm -hmm. And I ended up moving to Switzerland for a while in the French part. And I lived there for two years and I didn't learn any French. And part of the reason was because there are so many English speakers in Switzerland that I never really had to learn the language. But when I came back to the United States and moved to Michigan, it was then I decided that I was actually going to learn French in the middle of Michigan, right? And so I took French lessons and I finally figured it out. It's For me, the turning point was, was when I started thinking in the other language. And so when I could actually think in French, bad French, by the way, not good <laughs> French, but when I could actually think in French was when I was able to speak it. Yeah. I certainly wish I had had an app like yours. Do you teach French or do you, what, what languages do you cover now? We offer Spanish, French, English. We're going to be coming up with German, Italian, Portuguese, all of the main popular languages that we have. But to go back to your point, I think you're certainly not alone, right? There's actually scientific research behind the way we learn in that, um, I think like a popular one is by the National Training Laboratories. They call it the learning pyramid. It may not be exact to the numbers, but they basically found that the way human brains retain information is that we retain about 5% from, I believe it was lectures, so like a university lecture. And, and if you ask anyone what they actually remember learning from high school or college, a lot of people can't point out a lot of the information they've learned. And 10% from books, 20% from visual like apps or videos. And you get up to the 75% to 90% mark of retention when you actually immerse yourself, right? When you're, when you're teaching it to others, when you're thinking in the other language. But this applies to any skill, not just language. So it's, it's certainly a research-based way to learn in a different way that's actually more effective for the human brain. Yeah, I think I was fortunate because I had heard the language almost daily. It was on TV. I was surrounded by it. And then when I finally came back and applied myself, I was able to make at least some minimal progress. For sure. And finally conquered my language difficulty. So how long have you had RIPE going? We've been running with our original product for about two and a half years. And our original product was actually connecting people for live one-on-one -on -one lessons online. So we were, I don't know what the right analogy is, but it's kind of like Airbnb for language teachers where you can tap a button and you can connect with someone across the world to teach you Spanish. This could be from someone from Argentina uh, and this is literally the case where I had, when we started, my previous teacher in Argentina that I called up to ask if she wanted more clients. And she's like, yes, of course. And then I had a friend of mine in New York that wanted to learn Spanish. So I literally would just connect them, like matchmake them. I was like a dating matchmaker except for languages. And then I had someone from Colombia, and it just started to grow from there. So it was really just a live one-on-one -on -one marketplace uh, where people pay a monthly fee, kind of like a gym membership, and they get access to a certain number of lessons and, and unlimited access to teachers. And it's only recently, actually, that we decided to provide this complimentary product, which is certainly going to be much more affordable. Not everyone can afford the live private lessons, particularly in the younger audience. So we wanted to really, in order to reach our goal to, to help uh, connect 100 million people around the world through languages, we certainly needed to provide a more mainstream, more affordable product that's scalable. And that's where the idea of Ripe Go came from, which is going to be priced at $10 a month. And you can get access to the videos that we have. We've got the AI-powered speaking lessons. And if you want a live teacher, you can always add those on at a later point. So is there a specific curriculum that somebody who's just starting out wants to learn Spanish? Is there a series of steps that they would go through in your program? Is it organized in a particular way or does it differ for each student? So, I mean, I think the idea is that over time, it'll be more personalized. But right now, what we have done is gotten professional teachers to have created these curriculums. Uh, we've got four sets of levels. So beginner one, two, three, four, uh, intermediate one, two, three, four, organized so that you know exactly where you should go. And it's formulated that way in a relatively proven format in terms of how you go from beginner to advanced. Of course, where with AI and as we gather more data, similar to how Amazon would give you personalized recommendations or Netflix would give you specific content based on your, your needs, 
Uh, that's our end goal. Uh, but of course, we would have to gather more data from you and, and advance our algorithms. But that's our end goal is to make it a more personalized experience. I mean, eventually, in order to learn a language, you have to be able to communicate with somebody who speaks that language, right? So the student's going to need to connect with somebody who's fluent in that language, right? Yeah, exactly. And it, it's ironic. Uh, we're actually the only company that offers this integrated experience of the live one-on-one teacher and the app and the curriculum all in one app. Generally, it's a live marketplace or it's an app and you kind of have to like find one or the other. It's like very isolated. Whereas our goal is to have it all in one app. You're able to practice by yourself if you want using the R speech recognition and our AI powered speaking lessons. And then within the same app, you can connect with a live teacher as well. And I think the the other differentiator that we're trying to go for, I don't know if you guys use language apps before, like Rosetta Stone. I tried Rosetta Stone and how's yours different? There's a few differentiators. So the first one that I was going to mention, because I've used those as well, I've used YouTube, Duolingo. And the main problem that I saw initially was that these are apps that are trying to teach you for lack of a better word, fairly bland topics that you never really actually use in real life. So they'll teach you how to spell pineapple. So if or, you want to curse out a driver or something like that, yeah, you, you've got stuff the that I want to learn. You yeah. know, <laughs> stuff that's re- relevant for me, especially like in Argentina or something. And the that that was part of the main problem is like, okay, I learned some of the basics, but I can't really see myself talking to a friend this way. It was like very contrived and professional. Where I think. The way millennials are trying to learn is they're actually trying to build relationships with with people from different cultures, especially when they travel. So our goal was to modernize the curriculum from the ground up. So we have topics around how to talk to someone at a party, how to order at a restaurant, even putting in relevant context like how to communicate with your Airbnb host. And it's stuff that you would actually go through when you're traveling or even at home. Uh, And then, of course, the biggest differentiator for us between Rosetta Stone and any app is you're, you're using a completely different muscle, right? Instead of using your fingers where it's not actually going to help you practice, maybe it'll help you uh, learn some basic vocabulary, basic grammar, but you're not actually built around speaking it. So that's really the main goal that we have is um, we, we realize that most people learn a language to communicate and to build relationships with people. And that's we're social animals, right, at the end of the day. So that's really the core focus of our app. So I got to ask you this. Let's say somebody's traveling and maybe they're in Mexico City and they're trying to talk to somebody and they really are not very good at it. Do they ever call up the instructor and say, can you <laughs> talk to this guy for me? <laughs> well, hopefully <laughs> hopefully they, they contact us beforehand and they're actually trained. It's funny because I actually live in Mexico City, so there's a lot of people that speak English there. But yeah, I mean, hopefully they're they're in a position where they're able to get enough practice before they come to Mexico City, here in New York, or wherever they are, and they're already fairly, you know, ready. So are your students talking into the app, and then the app is, like, hearing it and then does something? Is that how it works? Or are you just kind of talking into the air and listening to yourself? The technology is actually not too much different than what we would use with Amazon Alexa or uh, with, with Siri. It's actually just speech recognition that recognizes the specific words that you're saying, and it's able to give you instant feedback. It's actually great because you don't need to go and bother your friends that speak another language and feel embarrassed or judged because you're saying it wrong. That's another psychological problem that we're solving is you're able to get that instant feedback and you're able to So practice. what kind of feedback does it give you? Does it correct you or does it say it the right way? How does it work? We'll be able to let you know immediately whether it's correct or not. And then we'll repeat back what the correct way to say that is. At least that's the initial version that we're thinking right now. Do you have people using this now? Uh, we do. We do, particularly the live lessons marketplace. And that's something where we've got hundreds of teachers at this point from all around the world that are using it. That sounds pretty cool. That's great. I want to talk to you about your entrepreneurial journey. Now, you write articles for Inc. Magazine Online? Yes. So how did you get that gig? There was a lot of stuff before Inc. Magazine. So my initial article, actually, I've just posted on Medium. I've particularly always believed that, especially in this day and age where gatekeepers are actually becoming less relevant, and Medium is Medium.com, if you guys are familiar with it, is, is, is probably the best example of that. I was one of the first users of Medium where you don't need any permission. You don't need to know any code to set up your own website. And you're able to just publish without needing anyone's permission. And if you're good, you'll get noticed. Right now, today, I'm actually one of the top 100 most followed people on Medium. So I grew uh, my audience initially from there and started to get attention from 
I think my first publication that I wrote for was like Ask Men, askmen.com. And they were interested in my story about how I dropped out. And then it just kind of snowballs from there. But I think the big takeaway for people that are listening is try to figure out a way just to get your material out there because I think we're no longer in the age of asking for permission from gatekeepers, whether that's someone that's in Hollywood or someone that's in entrepreneurship. Well, that's a plus and a minus, though. I mean, the gatekeepers, though, also have the power to promote, right? And so if they like your stuff, then they can be good at getting it out there. Even if you write good content or have good content, getting noticed sometimes can be a real challenge. I mean, we all like to think that if we do good content, people are going to notice, they're going to like it, they're going to become popular like you, but it doesn't always work that way. Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, it's a plus and minus, right? Because I think the the advantages of being able to put your work out first is like you're never going to be as good as you want to be in the beginning, right? Especially when you do the radio or the podcast or writing or stand-up, whatever your art is, you're never going to be as good. So it's almost good that you don't have these gatekeepers promoting you. I wanted to publish a legal article one time. I had the senior lawyer said, no, you don't want to publish. And I was so mad and so embarrassed. And then 20 years later, I find it in the attic and I read it and it's like, thank God I didn't publish this. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. So we're coming to the end. So what's the best place for people to find you? Probably the best thing is you guys can check out my podcast, Growth Minds. Uh, you guys can just Google that, Growth Minds, Sean Kim. You can check out our website at rypeapp.com. And then you can find me at hey Sean Kim in any social media outlets. Now you're making me want to learn another language. I really want to learn <laughs> Spanish. <laughs> I, I'd like to no. work on my English. <laughs> <laughs> I want to learn cat. <laughs> yeah, if you could put some animal languages in there, I think you'd have a big hit. <laughs> yeah. That's coming soon, guys. Yeah. <laughs> so, so stick around. Listeners, if you just tuned in, you should go back and listen to Sean on the podcast, which comes out tomorrow. And we'll be right back with more of the show. Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart on Passage to Profit with our special guest, Sean Kim. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearheart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearheartLaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law, www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. Together, we can change the world. This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And our special guest this evening, Sean Kim. And now it's time for our executive spotlight. It's really an honor to have my special friend here, Jeff Harmon, who's a fantastic leadership coach. He's helped myself and Gearhart Law in innumerable ways. But today he's going to be talking about his new software application, The Intentional Leader, which is a cloud-based leadership training and coaching coaching program for executives. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you, Richard. Can you tell us a little bit about your new software application? I would love to. I'll tell a little bit of the story of how we got here. I was a, a coach, as you know, as you introduced me for a number of years, and I just got frustrated that more people couldn't have access to high quality leadership training and coaching. Most leaders just don't have access to that type of support. So the intentional leader was born out of that frustration and that desire to serve hundreds, thousands, or even more, hundreds of thousands of leaders all across the world and give them the opportunity that to date so few people had the option to have. It's a really interesting concept, scaling leadership coaching. Uh, how did you come up with the idea and how does it work? So I came up with the idea that we had to use technology, that my time as a coach or one of my coaches on my team, their time is finite. So we had to use technology to be able to scale their impact. And so we're using a technology platform that creates community and also creates a direct channel 
for leaders to be able to access their coach. So if they're having a tough week or going to have a challenging conversation with their boss or with a colleague next week, ordinarily they would have no one to go to. Their boss is busy. HR often isn't the right place to go. And so now with the intentional leader, they have a place to go, an expert leadership resource that can help them navigate through that situation. So do they have to make an appointment to go there with their coach or can they just say, I need help? Can you help me tomorrow or right now? Or Through our platform, it is on demand. So at any given point, 24-7, they can access the platform and make a request to their coach. And we always promise a response within 24 hours, 24 business day type hours. Um, But often it's much quicker than that. Our coaches are constantly checking the platform to see who needs support and what that support will need. And often we'll proactively reach out to our, our users and say, how can we help today? What's going on for you where we can add value and help you be more successful? So do you get the same coach every time, or could it be a different coach if your coach is busy with someone else? We are a B2B platform, so we bring our service into organizations, and every account or every client in which we have a cohort or a group of leaders who are on the platform, they will have the same coach, and they will have the same coach all the time. The only reason why somebody else might step in is if their coach was sick or on vacation But typically, nine times, nine and a half times out of 10, they're going to have a conversation or a virtual type of conversation with the same person every time. Is this a live conversation? Is it like a chat feature? Is there AI involved? It's no AI. I won't say that we'll never use AI, but the high touch of a real human being and someone who has been on the ground, all of our coaches have been leaders, supporting other leaders, leading organizations themselves. Uh, So it always will be a a human, and we have different levels of service. So sometimes for our highest level of service, you'll have instant direct message, almost real-time, synchronous conversation. For another level of service, you'll have electronic interaction, typically via email. And then some of our clients want a live one-on-one conversation where they would schedule a time and hop on the phone and have either a Zoom call or a phone call with their coach. So we provide different levels of service based on the need and what the level of issues might be that someone needs support with. So is that active right now? Do you have people using it? Yeah, we have over 150 users on our platform right now. We're about one and a half years old. Uh, We've spent 2019 to really invest in the technology and all of the different innovations to create a real-time level of support. And so we have about 150 users, and we have a, a strong pipeline of people who are interested in the platform. One of the special places where people are interested are new leaders, creating a possibility for training and the availability of a coach for new leaders. That's great. Yeah, I mean, it's such a fantastic idea because it really cuts down on the barriers of somebody having to go and travel to somebody else's site. It's all virtual. You have different levels of support. So I think it's really a fantastic idea. You've been an HR coach now for a while, right? Yeah, I've been a leadership coach, not specifically HR, but a leadership coach for at all levels of organization in the organization from CEO down to frontline supervisors. I bet you've heard a lot of stories Mm. in the workplace. The most interesting ones are when someone really wants to be attentive to the needs of those that they're leading and just doesn't know how to do it. They were never invested in. They never had the training. The leaders that we serve are highly technical. So they were scientists or engineers or accountants, and they work their way up through the ranks and now find themselves in leadership roles. They have a desire. They have the will. They just don't have the skill to be able to support and serve their the people that they want to support. I had one leader approach me saying he had a dispute with a colleague over fantasy football. <laughs> And now, was this pretty intense? or It was very emotional because if you know anything about fantasy football, it can get pretty competitive and pretty intense. And so there was a disagreement about fantasy football in the office. This happened 
to be a professional services firm. And this leader, my client, came to me asking for support of how to navigate through that conversation to resolve the conflict around fantasy football. Those kinds of issues can take on an importance greater than really what they're talking about, right? I mean, there's sometimes there's underlying issues with those things too, right? Absolutely. And they have different options of which they can get support. So on the intentional leader, we have self-paced learning. So we we take on an approach of micro learning that every lesson that we deliver to our clients can com- be completed in 10 minutes at a time. So when there's an interpersonal issue, we might direct them to one of the modules or one of the lessons within a module that they can take on and, and learn on their own, build those skills. So do you ever get people from each side, like the Patriots guy and the Giants guy <laughs> <laughs> that are both coming at you at the same time saying, what do I do with this idiot? <laughs> I've never actually had a coaching situation where I was coaching both people on both sides of the table. <laughs> what, whatever. Playing mediator instead. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Our focus as coaches in our organization on the intentional leader is about the person. We have a rule that you can't coach a person who's not in the room. Mm. So if you come to me and say, well, I'd really like to fix my colleague who sits sits in the the cube (laughs) next to me, we're really clear that we say we don't coach anybody who's not in the room. So all of our coaching is really focused on the individual who's bringing the question or the issue and helping them be more successful. So what happened with the fantasy football situation? It was very emotional because there was money involved. I just helped this leader talk through a strategy of engaging with the other party to listen, to show up with empathy, to ask questions, to put himself in the other person's shoes. It really is a classic case of building influence or having influence when you don't have authority. In this case, it was a colleague who they didn't have authority over. They were coworkers. And so it was really a classic situation of building influence when you don't have formal authority in the organization. So talking that leader through what those steps are and having a successful conversation. So getting back to something we were talking about earlier, I think this is fascinating when you have people who are technically trained, who are taking on leadership roles, and they have to make a shift from just focusing on technical things to more softer skills, leadership skills. What do you tell a person who's in that situation and they're trying to make that transformation? The most important step is their mindset, that when they get that promotion from an individual contributor or a project leader where they were honing in on some specific subject matter, it's their mindset. They have to realize, okay, I'm no longer just the expert. Now I'm a leader and I have to empower and equip and lead others to do the things maybe that I was great at. And so really it's a decision or a choice in terms of how you see yourself because most of those folks, those highly technical expert contributors, they have been answer people all their life. They're the ones who everyone goes to for an answer and now the shift as they move from individual contributor, expert to a leader is now less to ask or to have all the answers and now to ask better questions that engage and lead others. So years ago, many years ago now, when I worked in the chemical industry, some people would grumble, well, just because this person was really good at being a chemist and doing this kind of research, they promoted him to a manager and they don't know anything about it. So do you start from like ground zero and train these people? Yeah, that's really who the intentional leader is designed for. It's designed for any leader but we specialize in helping the person that you just described, Elizabeth, and in helping them shift their mindset. All of our training, all of the micro learning that we do on the intentional leader, number one is to help them shift their mindset, that I am no longer the expert, the answer guy or gal, but I'm the one equipping others. So in all of our work, all of our training on the platform, it's number one to help them shift their mindset And then the coaching and the community that we create around the learning is to help them have some accountability and have some support. A lot of times these folks, they're so busy, they're ultra busy, and they just don't get the support that they need to make that shift into a leadership role. I'm curious now, we've talked about sort of first level beginning leaders. What sort of skills do the higher level leaders have that they develop over time or maybe they have them naturally or through their environment, whatever, but what are some of the differences between a high level leader and a beginning leader? To be very frank, it's only scale. 
the skills that we teach the frontline supervisor are the exact same leadership skills and mindset that the CEO needs in her or his role. So it's really about scale because with the intentional leader and, and the leadership coaching and training that we do, we make a clear distinction. It is not management. Management is about strategy. Management is about the details of the numbers and breaking down spreadsheets and doing forecast. That's management. It's super important, but it's different than leadership. And so when we talk about the difference between a frontline supervisor, maybe a 23-year-old kid who's getting her or his first manager role, all the way up to the CEO of a multinational organization, when it comes to leadership, it's about scale. And so the fundamentals are the same, but the conversations that we're having might be a little different because of the scale and also because of the gravity of the impact that leadership might have. So do you ever get anybody who really doesn't want this training? Because I'm thinking of technical people and there's an answer. You know, you do a titration, get the number and that's the right number. And they very often look down on soft skills. They're like, you know, I'm too smart for soft skills. So how do you convince them? We certainly do try. Because we're a B2B platform and we're going into organizations, it is critical to have senior level sponsorship of that cohort. We call them the leader of leaders. We insist on having a champion who is the leader of leaders who is going first, engaging and participating in the training and the coaching themselves. And they're creating community and conversation and accountability within the organization because we can only do so much. As an organization, Brilliance Within Coaching, through the intentional leader, we can only do so much. We rely on the sponsorship of that leader of leaders to work with those individuals to help them see the benefit and the value. And another thing that we do is we connect everything that we do with the goals of the organization and of the individuals that we're serving. Oh, so then their bonus depends on whether they do this or not. Well, <laughs> I mean, sometimes. That's up to the organization of how they attach the learning and development with performance goals and with compensation. That's up to every organization. But at a minimum, our relationship with that organization, with our clients, is connected directly to what are your goals and what's the training and what's the flavor of the coaching that we will bring to that organization that's going to directly support their goals. We want them to have an extraordinary ROI as it relates to their investment in the intentional leader. Going back to this management versus leader role, mm -hmm. so many of our listeners are entrepreneurs or small business people. It's really not practical for their organization to have a leader and also a manager. So how does somebody who has to handle both, what do you recommend how they function in both roles, I guess, simultaneously? Well, there's more than just manager and leader. Sometimes there's counselor. Sometimes there's therapist. Uh, there's lots of different hats that an entrepreneur, especially in a smaller organization, has to wear. And all of them are valuable. There is no one that I would say is greater than the other. They're just different. And so it's about self-awareness and it's about mindfulness. And mindfulness sometimes gets this squishy feeling, especially in the business marketplace. But it's just mindful about who do I need to be and how do I need to show up to the situation? So many leaders, whether they're in startups or in large organizations, they're on autopilot and they're in constant reactive reactive, reactive mode. And so what we teach, we have one module called how to be a mindful leader. It's about being mindful in the moment and how do I need to show up here and realizing that there are different roles that you need to play on any given day. So what would you describe as the perfect leader? I know there's no such thing, but as close as you could get. There's lots of different opinions on that, Elizabeth. For me, everything that I do and what the intentional leader is built on is something called servant leadership. And I'll summarize it in a very, very direct way. It's people first with still an emphasis on results, but people first. So when it comes to leadership, that the ideal leader, in my opinion, is they have a mantra that says, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's not about my survival. It's not about me being right. It's about others. It's about people. To me, 
that's an ideal picture of a leader. Jim Collins, in his classic book, Good to Great, he talks about a fifth-level leader. What he's really talking about or who he's really talking about is a servant leader. And so that, to me, is a profile of someone that's not guaranteed success because they have to be good managers too, but it puts them in a great position to be able to equip and enable others to come along. I love that definition. I remember talking with uh, an executive who I really respected, and I said, well, tell me about your job. And he said, well, my job is to keep this organization healthy. His job was to look at the different parts and things that were going on and address issues as they came up and make decisions that would help the organization thrive. And I, I really thought that was a great definition of leadership. There was one author who wrote about almost that exact same thing, and he wondered, well, why don't more people do that? Because the results speak for themselves. And, and a CEO like the one that you were talking about, Richard, he turned to this author and said, a lot of CEOs, a lot of organizations think it's beneath them, that they have to focus on the smart side of the business not the healthy side of the business. Jeff Harmon, leadership coach, The Brilliance Within, and he's also started a new online platform, The Intentional Leader, which is a cloud-based program for leadership training and coaching. So we'll be right back after this message. You're listening to Passage to Profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. There's never been a better time to start your own business. The opportunities are infinite and only limited by your imagination and enthusiasm. At Gearheart Law, we believe the most successful companies all have one thing in common. They start with a solid foundation first. Gearheart Law has years of experience protecting entrepreneurs, ideas, and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at www.gearheartlaw.com. Our professionals will create a custom strategy designed to fit your needs and your budget. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection, licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Visit gearheartlaw.com. Together, we can change the world. Visit G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W.com. This ad has been read by a non attorney spokesperson. Passage to Profit continues with Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. Time for the pitches. But before we start, some vital info. When you're listening to these two pitches, think about which one you like best and then go to the Passage to Profit page on the Gearhart Law website and vote. That's Gearhart Law, G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W. Everyone gets one vote and the voting is open for four and a half days. How do we come up with four and a half days? Anyway, it's until Friday morning at 10 a.m. Don't forget, too, to like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And just remember the name of the show by imagining you're walking down a passage with a huge pot of gold at the end, Passage to Profit, so get your friends to vote. That's right. And may your passage be short and your profit be huge. And now on to the pitches. Each contestant gets two minutes to pitch, followed by a discussion with Sean, Jeff, and us. The best overall vote getter gets a professionally produced video of their pitch, a $500 value. And it goes on to our YouTube channel. So let's get started. Our first pitch is someone who was on the show a year ago. Nero, I'm not even going to try to say your last name because I, I don't want to embarrass myself. Um, but she's going to repitch her project so everybody knows what it is. And then we're going to talk about the progress that she's made. Welcome, Nero. Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. I'm Nero Malavarpu. I'm the founder of Mobile Arc. No, as a mother of two young boys, I was always scrambling to stay on top of their activities in and out of school and stay connected to the school community. This printed school directory that you see, Elizabeth, was my go-to thing. I had one of those long ago. <laughs> and if you're looking you at can... it, it's like all torn to pieces and shredded and, uh, you know, phone numbers written on it and everything else, right? Yes, and um, this was my lifeline. However, short of tying this around my neck, I could never find <laughs> this book when I needed it the most. And this is why I came up with Mobile Arc, a one all-in-one platform for parents to get everything about their school at their fingertips and also for the PTAs, a fundraising and communications platform. And that's what we are today. We serve dozens and dozens of school districts and tens of thousands of parents use our app to get everything about their school at their tips. 
it sounds like a problem looking for a solution. So what motivated you or how did you come up with the idea to develop this? As I was saying, as a mother, right, I was just trying to stay on top of everything. And I, in those days, I had a BlackBerry and I was always <laughs> looking through my email to find out when the next school event was. or And there was always a change of time for the rehearsals or whatever it was, the soccer practice. And so it was, uh, there was not one place to find everything, no calendar, no website. So I put together first a collaboration website and eventually we made it into an app. When the iPhones came around, uh, everyone had apps. Of course, we, we invented this only after the iPhones came. So now there is an app that parents can use to get everything. Like they can connect to the school and call, yeah. email, text any parent, teacher or staff member. That's great. I think the hardest thing when, I mean, coming up with it was hard, but is getting the schools to adopt it, right? Yes, that is a challenge. Schools are always slow so to what? move in the direction of technology. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's a, such a no-brainer because we had these silly books for years and, you know, it would be so much more convenient to have this information on your iPhone. So what are some of the hurdles you're facing? We always go to the parent organizations. Parent organizations are led by parents and they work with the school to do all the programs in the school. So it was not that hard to convince the parent organizations organizations because they also produce the uh, directory. But more than that, we have become more like a payment platform also. So we have an entire e-commerce platform now and school districts use it because parents belong to multiple schools and then they need to pay for, let's say, spirit wear or, you know, their school magnets and school lunches, in fact. And parents go to their app, pay for it, and our payment platform automatically distributes it to the right schools. And we work with Stripe, PayPal, Merchant Services services and all kinds of uh, payment platforms. And that is our strength. Nero, we had the opportunity to meet about four year, four or five years ago when you were in an incubator, an yes, accelerator. Yes. I'm wondering, what do you see, given the move of technology and the advancement of technology, what do you see for Mobile Arc in the next three years? What's the cutting edge for what you want to accomplish? Yes, I think uh, th this is already doing a lot for schools. They're collecting millions of dollars really using this app effortlessly because it goes directly into their accounts. The accounting is done for, for them. We have reduced the time and uh, effort that was put into all of this before. And not only that, we are looking to, we, we can go in a couple of directions and we are uh, evaluating which is the best direction. One of the things we are looking at is also, we work very well, it's a very, um, uh, the way to put it is it's a multi-dimensional system that can go, you know, that can distribute on various levels. So let's say you have a state level system, then it can distribute to organizations across the state level. And again, it can go into the district level. So that is one thing for schools, but also for nonprofits or even commercial organizations that are collecting money across the nation, let's say. And they have, imagine a Red Cross, there's a national organization and there are local organizations. And you want to distribute this easily to all the organizations, parents or whoever the members can go in and pay for anything. And automatically it'll go to the right branch, you know, through one system and if they, uh, they belong to multiple services, they can pay in one place. So, so that is one direction that we are headed in. Could you, for instance, say, hey, Alexa, pull up Mobile Arc and pay all my bills. I don't know if you want to give Alexa your bank account information. But <laughs> they already have <laughs> it. <laughs> That's a good question. We have already um, kind of built a pilot uh, voice app where, you know, parents can talk. We have actually done an Alexa app where a pilot app where parents can talk to the app and say, hey, what's for lunch today? You know, we got all the lunch menus across the board and we built that. We haven't yet released it. But, you know, again, there is, um, you know, there is a fear in parents, right, and parent organizations that there's a lot of information that is being collected when you use voice apps. And parents as such don't like voice. That is why Alexa apps haven't taken off that well. So, yeah, that is one of the, um, you know, directions we thought of, tech, like, you know, speech apps. But I think, you know, a key 
of your technology is mm-hmm. that it helps schools raise money and PTAs. Exactly. And it simplifies the process. You don't have to get tons and tons of people involved. Exactly. And it simplifies a very important function for a PTA. Yes. I'm curious to know what's the uh, reception when you talk to the school boards about this. Because just from friends of mine that have been in the industry where they've sold software to help teachers better collaborate with students. I do know like the sales cycle of these uh, schools can be quite long, similar, maybe not as long as the government, Mm -hmm. uh, but it tends to be like a longer sales cycle. So how do you see yourself like scaling a business like this? That is why we go to parent organizations and parent organizations are run by parents. They are not under the control of the board and they're usually run by type A parents <laughs> who have been like out of, like, you know, they've been lawyers, whatever, and they've just... Hungry for raising, power. <laughs> yeah, and they have like really, they, they're very talented and very passionate, I find. And I, I almost find about a couple of them in every district and I'll get their attention and they know then this is a great product for themselves and for the community. And so they drive the whole thing. Believe me, I just have to sit back and do the technology and they drive everything in the community. Of course, we provide all of the supporting material, but we have done this so many times that we can do this over and over again very effortlessly. So that brings me to my question. How many times have you done this? How many schools do you have on board now? We have uh, over 100 schools that are using the platform and, you know, that have different districts. They are spread across the U.S. But, you know, it is also important that each school and each school district can have up to 5,000 to 10,000 parents. And you have active users and you have the whole cycle. So, you know, you have and also you have an opportunity to connect them with vendors who want to really like, you know, make use of this audience. So that is one direction that we are expanding into a mobile marketplace where, let's say, you have a, a whole bunch of tutors who want tutoring opportunities. Then they can come to this audience and advertise themselves. And what's the business model? Business model is the uh, school district or the PTO organization, they pay for the entire school. So they pay an annual fee and we also get a cut of the advertising revenue. The goal is to expand this to also other nonprofits and groups, Mm -hmm. you know, that can make use of this platform as well as use the mobile marketplace, you know, where and that can grow, that can have a life of its own because, you know, it's like symbiotic because the mobile marketplace depends on the audience and the audience depends on the mobile marketplace to find things. So that can grow on its own as a two-way marketplace. Well, I'm sorry that we have to end this conversation. You've really made a lot of progress in the last year. Congratulations. This is fantastic. So can you please spell the name of the app and where people can find it? Oh, yeah. It's uh, Mobile Arc, M-O-B-I-L-E-A-R-Q, and you can find us at mobilearc.com, and we are also on Facebook, Instagram, and other places. You're listening to Passage to Profit on WOR 710, the voice of New York. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Lisa Askley, the inventress, founder, CEO, and president of Inventing A to Z. I've been inventing products for over 38 years. Hundreds of products later and dozens of patents. I help people develop products and put them on the market from concept to fruition. I bring them to some of the top shopping networks in the world. QVC, HSN, Evine Live, and retail stores. Have you ever said to yourself, someone should invent that thing? Well, I say, why not make it you? If you want to know how to develop a product from concept to fruition the right way, contact me. Lisa Askeles, the inventress. Go to inventingatoz.com, inventingatoz.com. Email me, lisa at inventingatoz.com. Treat yourself to a day chock full of networking, education, music, shopping, and fun. Go to my website, inventingatoz.com. Now back to Passage to Profit. Once again, Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart. And our guest this evening, Sean Kim, and also Jeff Harmon. We're on to our second and final pitch. Presenting this evening will be Russie and Chris Jones with the Potty Break app. You have two minutes. Go. Thanks for having us here. Our app is Potty Break, P-O-T-T-Y-B-R-A-K-E. And it's Potty Break like put on the brakes. And we're the ultimate bathroom locator. When your legs are crossed, you're sweating, you're doing that ever-popular potty dance, (laughs) we're here to help you find the closest place and the best fit to eliminate your problem. 
The perfect bathroom, or for a more urgent situation, a bathroom that will do in a pinch. In addition to this, in what could easily become a personal disaster, our online newspaper, aptly named The Daily Deuce, has articles that are both health and humor related. This helps keep you entertained and educates you about your bowel and gut health while you're working on your bowel health. Or if you feel chatty, you can message your friends on our in-app messaging platform. You can chat for as long as you want. And when you're finished with the conversation or the person, one flush and the conversation disappears. Or you can sit and shop with our affiliate partners, Squatty Potty, which is Judy, Bobby, and Bernie, and Carson, and Walla Box, and Brewer, fantastic products from fantastic people. Potty Break is a community-driven application. The entire premise is based on people helping people. Everybody likes to be the person with the best recommendation. Where's the best place to eat in New York? Where's the best place to get pasta? Where, you know, where is the best place? So we thought, why couldn't this work for bathrooms? From the people that want their bathroom to be used with the full-on experience. I want to go in. I want to do my business, get a latte, get in my car, or the traveler in uncharted territory. Looking for the nearest, cleanest bathroom option. We have the ability for the community to add the best kept secrets to our bathroom library. Wow. I can remember driving across country many, many, many years ago. I really had to go. We stopped at this gas station. I thought I was going to come out dead. (laughs) It was that bad. (laughs) Sometimes I don't get to come out. (laughs) I understand that. Wow, this is great. So where do you get your information about the bathrooms? Well, we started with a Google-based map, and then we are building our own API library where the community will have their input. So there's a lot of technology behind this. Yes, which I understand about, oh, let's see, on percentage-wise, two. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I'm not a big tech person. It's a joke at my house. Whenever I get a new phone, they all run because who's going to program mother's new phone? (laughs) So they thought it was most uh, interesting that, and spiteful that I called them all up and said, and who made a nap, kids? Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's your mama. You know? Before we came on the air, I was mentioning, Rusty, about bathroom issues around the world, um, safety, sanitariness around the world. How could potty break be of benefit to places where the bathroom situation is downright dangerous. As I found out from one of our co-hosts here, there is a foundation that women in India have problems with, of course, there's disease everywhere. But in India, there seems to be a problem with safety of women that Mr. Harmon told me about. And we're in 28 countries. We launched four weeks ago this Friday. We're already in 28 countries. We have over 1,000 users. And most of those users, a lot in Mexico City, by the way, and um, they're very interested in finding the cleanest, safest area to go to the bathroom. And by safest, it could be not down in an alley or it could be, and by cleanest, simply to wash your hands when you're finished. Do you guys have like a rating system as well where, I mean, it's probably useful information, right? Yes, we do. do. We have. <laughs> but of course. <laughs> and, but, but, yeah, but yeah. I mean, So, so is the bottom of the list uh, the Santa Cans at Giant Stadium? <laughs> it's biohazard. No, no they're, we, we're very nice and we rate with what normal people would call a five-star system. It's just piles of poop. And so we have the fair uh, in a pinch, good, excellent, and you're thrown away from home. Um, <laughs> it's fun. It's educational, but nobody really knows they're learning anything because we're just having a good time. Speaking of home, Rusty, I love your accent. Can you tell us where you're from? I am from Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, I've been there about three years. I actually grew up... Um, The child of attorneys. So this is what could happen to our kids. (laughs) I wish, because obviously she's hit on something that everybody needs. Uh, Be careful what you wish for. (laughs) Um, But we, seriously, we... um, I grew up about 20 miles south of University of Kentucky, 
So we bleed blue. And then I moved to the anti-Christ, basically, <laughs> University of Louisville, which, you know, so I, as I was talking earlier, royal blue is our color. We bleed blue. If I wore red, my dad would roll over. I am fascinated, however, when, not only with the, the whole bathroom app thing, but how you've managed to capitalize on a marketing opportunity that I don't know that anybody's really thought of, which is marketing to people specifically through an app, products, services, while they're using the facility, right? And a a lot of people do read, (laughs) and you you have a captive audience, right? And I think that's a fantastic marketing approach. Well, it was kind of an easy, easy thing uh, when you think about it. Everybody poops. So we started with that, you know, who do we take out of our audience? Well, even infants, you know, they're not using the phone. They're not looking for a locator, but boy, when they do, mom or dad is on it. Right. Because, you know, they're tired of that in the back of the SUV, you know, opening up the hatch and changing the child. We really started thinking about it when, because I travel a lot and I have to have a handicapped bathroom. I have Parkinson's and cancer and it's impossible for me to get up off a stall. Uh, There's no more, as Elizabeth, I'm sure, can relate, there's no more of the squat and hover for me. So it needs to be clean. I need the bar to get up. And when I couldn't find it, I thought, gosh, there should be an app for that. Yeah, Mm -hmm. you know, it's amazing that you're not the first person we've had on the show who has invented something because they had a physical disability. What amazes me is that you keep going, that, like you're doing more than a lot of people are doing. I commend you for that. Oh, thank you so much. I have vowed. I even gave it a name. I call it Parky. And uh, Parkinson's and I have been very close friends. We became very close friends. It wasn't going to stop me. It wasn't going to change me. And uh, it's actually been a godsend because it forced me to quit what I was doing which was in I was in the nursing field and I could no longer do it with the shakes and tremors and it forced me then to pursue other avenues to find something to keep myself busy. Rusty, four weeks you're just four weeks in. Yes. So what does week 10 look like? What does I, that look like? I can't wait to see. No we have um We are very fortunate in that I have a business that uh, I started two years before I was diagnosed. And at Reliolite, it's a decorative emergency lighting business, which we licensed out to uh, Empowered Light. They were guests just a couple of weeks ago. They have our products. So I got bored and I decided, you know, if I'll write a book. And then I thought, you know, I think I'll work on something they say to brain train as you pointed out you need to keep it young and learn something like you were talking about you know the languages and everything with ripeapp.com you know that keeps your brain moving keeps your brain young and I thought what is something I know absolutely nothing about apps so I'll make one well congratulations that's an outstanding first shot and it sounds like you've got a lot of success coming with your application and wish you all the success how can people find it again they can find us at www.pottybreak.com. We're on Android and Apple, just Potty Break. And it's a free app, right? Free app. All right. So take advantage. You're listening to Passage to Profit on WOR 710. We'll be right back after this message. What are entrepreneurs' most valuable assets? Their passion and ideas. We can't protect your passion, but we can protect your ideas. Trust Gearheart Law to protect your ideas with premier patent, trademark, and copyright services. There's never been a better time to start your own business. Contact us at GearheartLaw.com. At Gearheart Law, we have years of experience protecting entrepreneurs' ideas and brands using patent, trademark, and copyright protection. So if you have a new consumer product, a new software application that you're planning to build or sell, or a brand or company name that you want to protect, contact the experts at Gearheart Law, www.gearheartlaw.com. Don't let the wrong protection strategy ruin your business. All of our attorneys are passionate about protection and are licensed and qualified to represent you before the United States Patent and Trademark Office. Don't start your project without calling us first. Contact Gearheart Law on the web at G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W dot com. Together, we can change the world. 
This ad has been read by a non-attorney spokesperson. Now more with Richard and Elizabeth. Passage to Profit. And the lesson to take away is if you see a problem, fix it. <laughs> <laughs> now remember, everyone, go to the Passage to Profit page at GearHeartLaw.com. G-E-A-R-H-A-R-T-L-A-W, and vote for your favorite project. So to summarize, we had Nero with Mobile Arc, M-O-B-I-L-E-A-R-Q.com, the app that helps PTAs and schools keep track of everything. Our second pitch was with Russi Jones with PottyBreak.com, P-O-T-T-Y-B-R-A-K-E.com. That really solves a problem, helps you find a bathroom anywhere you are <laughs> or that you're close to. Um, vote for your favorite pitch between Nero and Russi. But even though you can't vote for our guests in our executive spotlight, we still want to find out where we can find them again. So, Sean, where do people find you? Yeah, you guys can check out Ripe at R-Y-P-E-A-P-P.com. Or you can find me on social media at Hey Sean Kim. Okay, and what about you, Jeff? A great place to find me is on LinkedIn. My handle there is Brilliant Coach. And if you want to know more about the intentional leader, that's brilliancewithincoaching.com forward slash intentional dash leader. And Sean, Jeff, do you have any final words of wisdom for our audience? I'll just share with the audience that how you lead matters. And so we need you to lead wherever you are. If you're at home, at the office, at church, in the community, please lead. We need you to lead. I would say I think when it comes to problem solving, we all have unique experiences and backgrounds from childhood all the way up to university and our young adulthood. And I think having and channeling that instead of, trying to copy other ideas and trying to find your own unique path uh, can often lead to the best ideas, to the best businesses that you can solve. So I would try to say when you're trying to start a business, try to reflect back on your personal problems because no one else has had the same experiences as you. That's excellent. Well, again, thank you guys for coming. Sean, you were here from Mexico City, I guess. I was, and, yes. Yeah. And uh, Russi was here from Louisville. So thanks all for coming. And we would also like to thank our media maven, Kenya Gibson. Our producer, Noah Fleischman, who is scrumptious. Our amazing engineer, Rob Barretts, and the whole iHeart team. And listeners, don't forget to join us next week for another excellent speaker and another round of pitches. And you can start thinking about what your pitch will be. And don't forget to like us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. This is Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart from Gearhart Law on iHeart Radio with Passage to Profit, WOR 710, the voice of New York. 